All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for tonight's program. Uh, we're going to do armchair travel to, let me see if I get this right, uh, Carta, uh, Cartagena? Cartagena. Cartagena. Okay. <laughs> and I'll be all talking right. about that in more detail in just a there minute. You go. Okay. So we're taking a visit to the South American port of Cartagena, Colombia, which captivates visitors with its rich history, vibrant culture, and stunning Caribbean charm. This well-preserved colonial architecture of the walled city, coupled with lively plazas and colorful streets, creates a unique atmosphere. From historic sites like Castillo oh, San Felipe to the lively local markets, <laughs> uh, Cartagena uh, offers an unforgettable experience. Uh, so this, I should have practiced this before we went live. Uh, sorry for the mispronunciations. Uh, so this program is led by the traveling librarian, uh, Jeff Klapes. I think I got that right. Uh, he's, he's the retired head of reference services at the BB Memorial Library in Wakefield. And he's also an avid traveler and photographer. And Jeff, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, this program is sponsored by the Friends of the Library. So all 125 of us who are watching live and also those that will watch the recording, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Jeff for joining us here tonight. And Jeff, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thanks, Robert. Thank, and thanks for having me back again. It's um, nice to see such a big crowd again. Um, I think um, for those of you who are in Massachusetts, I hope you enjoy tonight's program in particular because we're having miserable weather um, tonight and tomorrow. We're getting a winter storm that um, I don't think any of us were really quite expecting. It's either rain or snow, depending on where you are, but it's cold and lousy. So I hope you're going to enjoy going somewhere tropical and Caribbean, at least um, virtually. So I'm going to share my screen and we'll get started right away. Um, as Robert said, as always, um, you know how these programs work. Um, feel free to pop questions into the Q&A, and I will keep an eye on those as, as we go through the program. And if I can answer them along the way, I will. Um, otherwise, at the end of the program, we'll catch up with anything that we might have missed. Um, so let's get going. Get my pointer. Um, this is a trip that I did uh, very recently, actually, just in, in January. Um, and I have to say the only reason I did it is because I found an incredibly cheap fare. It was $2.99 round trip from Boston to Cartagena. So I thought it's January. I want to get away. <laughs> Let's just go somewhere. Um, so I went down for about five days, which was a perfect amount of time to see the city and do a couple of uh, uh, side trips. Um, from Boston, it's only about five hours or so. Um, if you fly via Miami, there's no direct flights. Um, at least from here, obviously, it depends on where you are in the country. Um, but to put uh, it on the map, um, Colombia, which you can see here, is the only country in South America that has both Atlantic and Pacific coasts. There's about 52 million people, um, mostly uh, in the cities, as you might imagine. And um, it's probably also, as you can guess, named after Christopher Columbus. Um, originally, much of the region um, in in the north of what is now South America, um, including Panama, was called Colombia until various different areas broke off and became independent, mostly in the 19th century. Um, as of 1886, um, the only part of that that region that still had Columbus's name attached to it was the modern nation that we call Colombia. Um, it's just divided into two. Uh, pretty clear geographic parts, the mountains, which are the very northern reaches of the Andes chain, um, and also the flat part in here, which is um, the northern part, the northern reaches of the Amazon interior. Um, the other major places to visit in the country, which I did not do on this particular trip, but I would love to go back, um, are the capital, which is Bogota in the mountains, also Medellin um, and Cali. Um, the three major cities um, besides Cartagena, which is on the coast. Uh, it has a reputation or did for quite a long time for being an extremely dangerous place, a well-deserved reputation, I might add, um, because of all of the, uh, the drug cartels and the violence, um, both against locals and tourists. Um, and it was definitely a place that you don't want to visit for a very long time. Um, that reputation has significantly changed in recent years. It is much, much safer. In fact, it is probably one of the uh, 
biggest, uh, most burgeoning uh, tourist economies in all of South America right now. Um, you still need to take reasonable tourist precautions like you need to take anywhere else. Um, but the kind of dangers that uh, existed 15 or 20 years ago just uh, are really no longer a problem. Um, and Cartagena in particular is extremely safe. Um, Cartagena, zooming in a little bit closer, is on the Caribbean side. Um, particularly the old city, which is where we're going to focus our time tonight, um, is extremely safe. They have a lot of uh, tourist police. Um, although, to be perfectly honest, I never felt remotely unsafe any of the time that I was anywhere in the city. Um, any, I felt no different than I would traveling anywhere in the United States or, or any city in Europe. Um, and as Robert, as, as we were talking initially when Robert was having trouble with the pronunciation, I do need to point out it is Cartagena. It is not Cartagena, which a lot of people, including myself, always thought. Um, there is no tilde in the name, and it is named actually after the city in Spain of the same name. It's got about a million people and was originally founded as a Spanish colony in the early 1500s, although um, it will come as no surprise that there were indigenous tribes here for thousands of years before any Europeans ever came to, uh, to South America. Um, the major sites that we're going to look at tonight are the old city, which is in this walled area here. If any of you have ever been to um, Puerto Rico and visited San Juan in Puerto Rico, you'll see a lot of similarities because it's, um, it is a, a similar kind of colonial style city um, with Spanish colonial architecture and uh, the remains of the walls, the protective fortified walls all around the city are, are still there and in beautiful condition. We're also going to visit a major fort, which is just outside um, the city and which protected the inland um, si uh, approaches to the city. Um, also a monastery uh, that's well known and has great views up on a little hill. Um, you can see the airport here, which is actually quite close to the city, only takes about 20 minutes or so to get to the airport. And also um, this area here, which I did not go to, called Boca Grande, um, it refers to, uh, uh, it means large mouth and it refers to the mouth of the bay um, south of the city. Uh, this is the larger of the two entrances to the mouth. Um, there's at the opposite end there's Boca Chico, uh, meaning the smaller entrance. And this particular area is full of skyscrapers, um, full of nightclubs and beach bars and uh, clubs and uh, noise and music, um, which did not particularly interest me, but if it interests you, it's the place to be if you want um, very uh, beautiful city beaches and lots of nightlife. Um, I preferred the more uh, historic center, so that's where I stayed. And that's where we're going to focus most of our attention tonight. Here's a, a clear view, uh, satellite view of the old city. Um, you can see here, and it's totally surrounded by um, walls, which we will see in a minute. Um, and it is a World uh, Heritage Site, UNESCO World Heritage Site now um, as well. And this is a model of what we were just looking at a second ago, the exact same location, um, but about 400 years early after the city and the port had been fortified with walls and castles um, and revetments all the way around uh, the city. And, and a good part of this open water area has since been filled in, um, although the bay, there's still quite a large bay around the city. It was during this time period in the 1600s that Cartagena became a major port for slave markets, um, as well as the Inquisition, uh, the Spanish Inquisition, which uh, lasted for about 200 years in the New World, and Cartagena was one of the main ports. Um, we'll talk about that more later because there's a, a very good museum about that that you'll want to visit if you, if you go. Um, the traffic is insane, so you definitely don't want to be renting a car. Uh, it's an extremely pedestrian-friendly city. Um, it's very flat in the historic city, and uh, it it's, has a grid pattern, so it's uh, it's very hard to get lost. Um, the streets are are have great street life. It's as I said, it's very safe. There's tons of restaurants and shops and museums. Um, so if you go, don't even think about having any kind of transportation other than your feet or possibly a taxi. There are taxis um, 
that are very inexpensive that if you want to go a little further out, you can easily get from one place to another. Um, just as an example of how crazy the traffic can get in the middle of, I, this was on the way to the, air, uh, to the airport. Um, and I don't know why these uh, teenagers were pushing carts full of old toilets around, but you know, that's what happens when you're traveling. Um, I also thought this was kind of funny. Um, of course, it's very hot there. Uh, it's not on the equator, but it's getting pretty close to the equator. So um, there are not really uh, distinct seasons in Cartagena way, the way you'd see in, uh, in other places. It tends to be pretty hot, pretty humid most of the year. There's a couple of time periods where it's you'll get slightly more rain and it's slightly drier. Um, but in general, uh, the weather is going to be in at least the 80s, um, and it's very humid uh, for most of the year and very hot. When I was there, it was uh, between 90 and 95 degrees, which in January was lovely, um, but even for, for five days, it was about as much heat as I wanted to, to deal with. Um, but I thought this was kind of funny because, of course, here in the United States, you can buy very expensive uh, silvery things to put on your um, on your windshield to keep it from get, keep your car from getting hot um, in Colombia they just use a piece of cardboard and if somebody steals your piece of cardboard you get another piece of cardboard uh, this was the street um, and in fact this is my hotel here um, the city as I said is very easily navigated uh, because of its grid plan and the architecture is is just gorgeous there's color there's the the typical colonial style uh with balconies like you can see here plants uh bougainvillea dripping over all of the balconies uh it's just a beautiful city my hotel which was very affordable only about 75 uh, us dollars which had a private bathroom uh, air conditioning and a delicious homemade breakfast um was only about 75 US dollars. You can spend a lot more if you want. Um, and certainly Cartagena is more expensive than the mountain cities like Bogota and, and Medellin. Um, it's very touristy um, and caters a lot to that. Um, but um, by American standards, it's still pretty inexpensive for a vacation. Um, right now, uh, there are about 4,000 uh, Colombian pesos, which is the currency that they use uh, to the dollar, which makes conversion a little difficult um, and kind of alarming when you go out for lunch and it costs you, you know, 200,000 pesos for lunch. Um, but as I said, it's actually, it's, it's a pretty cheap uh, trip um, if you want to escape the winter. Um, my hotel had this lovely courtyard with balconies, um, with lots of shade, very stylish bathrooms. Um, and a little swimming pool um, where you could at least cool off um, during the day. And at the top, there was this wonderful roof terrace that had sunbeds. Um, I sat there a little bit, but it was way too hot to sit there for more than maybe half an hour at most before uh, you had to get, get into the shade. Um, and they did have a shady area with these nice um, curtains that uh, allowed the breeze in but kept the sun out. Um, so it was it was a delightful spot and right smack in the middle of the city. Um, my hotel also had these nice little seating areas and a delicious breakfast with um, fresh fruit, which you can find everywhere in the city, and also uh, delicious coffee, which of course is very popular in, in Cartagena, um, homemade omelets made to order, um, juices of all different kinds. It was, it was really nice. Um, but I want to take you around the city and show you some typical streets like this one. Um, that have a lot of very standard uh, style colonial buildings, most of which are only maybe two, three, four stories high. So it's a very, it feels like a very old city. And it is. It's been, um, much of it has been renovated, but not overly so. You don't really feel like you're in a completely Disneyfied version of, of uh, a colonial city. There's a lot of street life with scads of pedestrians um, and lots of locals uh, selling all kinds of uh, local merchandise and fruit and, and uh, street food. Um, I'm gonna point out in this photo on the right, you can see a couple of skyscrapers way off in the distance. Um, and those are the, the beach, uh, the stretch of beach that I mentioned earlier called Boca Grande. Um, and you can see those looming over the old city in the distance. 
much of the surrounding walls and the bastions that were built starting in mostly in the uh, 17th century, roughly. Um, and most of them are still there in an excellent position. So you can actually stroll all the way around the city, almost all the way around at least. And the views are wonderful, especially at sunset because the city faces west. Um, so it's a perfect stop spot for a, an evening stroll when the weather gets a little cooler and you can watch the sunset over the Caribbean. Along the way, you will see wonderful examples of the traditional architecture with wooden balconies like this. Um, and I noticed also throughout the city, there uh, were all kinds of stylish door knockers of uh, some were historic and old, some were modern and artsy. Um, so here's a sample of some of the things that I saw. Um, looking north from the walls uh, to the Caribbean Sea, um, you can see a lot of the resemblance to Puerto Rico, as I, I mentioned before, if you've been there, it, it has a very similar feel to it with the same style of Spanish colonial fortresses. Um, I just noticed in the chat, there's a question about, um, is the water safe to drink? This might surprise you, but the tap water in Cartagena is perfectly safe to drink. Um, I had no problems the whole time I was there. Um, there are lots and lots of restaurants, which um, I'll show you in a little bit. Uh, raw fruit and vegetables um, are not a problem if you're in a restaurant. Street food, you always have to be a little bit more cautious of, um, particularly um, if you're eating any fruit that doesn't have its own peel. Um, I think it's always a safe bet, uh, no matter where you are, um, if you're eating fruits uh off the street from a street vendor, it's probably better to get fruits that you can peel um, because then you know that you're uh, you're not as likely to uh, be encountering any microbes. Um, but yes, the water is perfectly safe to drink right out of the tap. Um, here's some guys fishing along the coastline. Um, around the, the city walls, there is actually a, um, uh, a boulevard uh, with a lot of traffic. Um, and buses. This is um, a bus. Uh, this is not a city bus. This is something called the Chiva on, uh, on its off hours. These are popular in the evening, particularly in the Boca Grande area um, along the beaches. It's essentially a party bus, um, and you can get on with um, 50 friends or total strangers, and you can drink, and there's loud music, and people sing, and have a, have a fun time just driving around the city, making a lot of noise and getting drunk. Um, it, it is actually kind of a fun time. Um, I was there by myself, so it felt a little weird to do that on my own. Um, but um, it is a popular activity if, if you like that kind of nightlife. Um, the problem with this boulevard is um, the, the wind coming off the ocean uh, does cause some uh, traffic problems um, because it gets the uh, gets seawater all over the all over the street. Um, looking down, we're, we're looking down the coast towards the south, and you can see that modern district that I talked about called Boca Grande. It's just a long stretch of, oh, probably two or three miles worth of um, high high end skyscrapers that includes hotels, uh, condos, and resorts, beach bar bars, nightlife. Um, the the sandy beach along that stretch is very nice. Um, and has all kinds of amenities um, that you would find in any um, well-appointed beach where you can get drinks and food and, and there's music and so forth. Uh, if you want something a little more relaxed and isolated, you can do that as well. There's a number of offshore islands um, that have beautiful beaches and you can go either for the day um, by taking a tour or you could stay overnight for a night or two at some small resorts um, where you can have a nice sort of tropical beach vacation away from the city. Um, and those none of those are more than maybe an hour or so off the coastline. Um, so it's it's pretty easy to do either as a day trip or or a couple days. Um, I love this this image of this guy who had very sensibly found a cool place to sit and watch the ocean without sitting in the middle of the sun. Um, but you can see the interesting contrast between the old city and the new city. And because the walls are up high, um, because they're protective fortress walls, you're, you're up a little higher than the street and you get nice views um, down each of the, the little side streets 
of the beautiful colonial architecture, much of which is painted in, in incredibly vivid colors. This is one of the big public buildings. Um, it was originally a Jesuit convent and then later was turned into a hospital um, and now is used as a uh, naval museum of the Caribbean, if you're interested in naval history. Um, so the, the museum is quite um, well regarded and the building itself is, is quite interesting as well. Um, this old fashioned um, Corsair boat or pirate ship is now a museum of piracy, if you're interested in that as well. Um, Cartagena being on the coast obviously had to deal with piracy um, during its early history. Pirates were independent pirates were all over the Caribbean, all over the, uh, the Atlantic. And Corsairs were essentially um, pirates who were sanctioned by a particular government. So that's kind of the distinction between them. Corsairs were like official pirates <laughs> um, under the protection of some particular European uh, colonial government. Um, but I loved the, uh, if, if you've been to my programs before, you know how I, I, I love architecture. That's my particular interest. And I loved the architecture in old Cartagena because color is everywhere, especially the bright colors that you typically uh, associate um, with the Caribbean. And here's some examples of those kinds of balconies which catch the breezes and also um, screens um, like this one. Uh, some are made of wood, uh, modern ones may be made of, of metal, but um, they were used for security back in the old days and also um, uh, now as well. Here's another wonderful example. Um, I'm keeping an eye on uh, questions in the chat. I don't remember the name of my hotel, but I can find out and I can um, let Robert know. Um, or you can email me directly and I could let you know. English is pretty pretty widely spoken in the old city, at least, um, although to a limited degree. Um, it helps if you know a few words of Spanish, but if you don't, you're, you're going to be fine. I, um, I don't think it's really necessary to worry about language problems there. Um, almost everybody in a restaurant or a store or a museum is going to speak at least some basic English. Um, this building here, which uh, I love this kind of coral color, um, used to also be a monastery. Um, and it has since been converted into a Sofitel luxury hotel where the rooms start around $400 a night. Um, there's a number of restaurants. You can eat very inexpensively um, in Cartagena, or you can eat very fancy if you want. I, I wanted to go to this place and I, I ended up not having time. Uh, this is one of the better trendy restaurants that serves uh, Peruvian cuisine. And just some more street scenes, um, a typical corner cafe. Um, and if you want, um, one of the nice ways to get around the city, if you don't feel like walking, uh, particularly in the heat, is to take a horse-drawn carriage. Um, and if you're not in the carriage, it gives everybody else the enjoyment of hearing the nice kind of old-fashioned sound of horses' hooves clopping along the, um, the streets. One thing that I did see pretty much everywhere, um, and this is because uh, as nice as the city is, it's very touristy. I have to say that it's extremely touristy. Um, and you will find these sort of Carmen Miranda women um, everywhere, hoping that you will pay for a photograph. Um, Carmen Miranda actually was Brazilian, but um, you get the idea. Um, They're dressed in these, uh, these traditional costumes. They all have the same outfit. They're all walking around with fruit on their heads. Um, and it's kind of uh, the first couple of times you see them, it's it's amusing. But after a while, you realize they're on every street corner. And basically, um, it's they're hoping that you will want to have your photograph taken with them and give them a, um, a little bit of money. Uh, but you really cannot walk uh, more than a couple blocks in the city without seeing them in their bright outfits. Uh, but I want to show you a couple of the actual monuments uh, that are worth visiting, um, if if for no other reason than to get out of the heat and get inside to, to some air conditioning. These are the towers and the dome of the Sanctuary of San Pedro Calver, 
uh, which is one of the major sites in the in the center of the old town, and it um, was a Jesuit monastery. He was a uh, he's now sainted. Um, he arrived in 1610, and he worked in the city for about 40 years, um, trying to help the enslaved population at the time. Um, this is the um, the front of the building. Um, because the city has all these narrow little streets, sometimes um, you can't actually see the beautiful domes of some of the churches until you get a little bit further away. This is the facade um, presiding over the, the, the plaza. The inside of the church is actually kind of simple, very austere, but, um, but very moving. Uh, the saint himself is buried under this altar um, off in the back. And you can explore the church. It has a very calm, peaceful kind of beauty to it. Um, in addition to the church, there's an attached museum, uh, which is excellent. Has um, it's it's more or less a, a history of religious art, um, as well as some modern art, um, and also a history of the saint and his life, um, and the history of the church and his involvement um, in trying to help the the enslaved people in in South America. Um, but it's a it's a very nice museum, and most of the places that you might visit in Cartagena, the museum, Cartagena, the museums, the shops, things like that, that none of them have very expensive um, admissions, no more than a few American dollars at most. Um, this particular place had a number of rooms that had been restored, preserved from the 17th century, and in the back is a wonderful. Uh, cool garden, very serene place for contemplation and quiet, just to get away from the the hubbub of the streets um, outside. These fancy buildings um, across the street um, are on the opposite side of the plaza, and uh, to the right, kind of behind it, is uh, what is now a contemporary art museum showing art of the Caribbean area. The center of the city, uh, or the old city at least, is called Parque de Bolivar, um, which has a statue of uh, Simón de Bolivar, the, the Venezuelan soldier who led uh, revolutions against the Spanish uh, uh, colonials uh, in, in South America. So this uh, the park is beautiful, shaded. Um, here's his statue. Um, so it's a nice, cool respite from the heat, but also there's always something going on um music dancing um all kinds of stuff going on um as well as uh cool drinks fresh fruit um street food and so forth um, it also has a very nice view of the tower of the cathedral which we'll see in just a moment surrounding um this plaza are a number of the most important sites in the city um one of which is the cathedral. Technically, this is called the Cathedral de Santa Catalina de Alejandria. Um, and it has this gorgeous tower. It was built in the, uh, in the late 16th century. Um, and inside it has a monumental gilded wooden altar, which uh, was installed about 100 years later. Um, the interior is very, very impressive, particularly the wooden ceiling that you can see on the top, um, as well as the um, uh, the paintings and mosaics along the top as well. Here's the side entrance. Um, the the tiled um, scenes here are from um, mostly Old Testament uh, scenes. Very Spanish style to it. And with the exception of some refurbishment that they did on the tower, most of the church really is about as... Um, original as it, as it was when it was first built, which is kind of nice. Although one interesting historical tidbit about this church is that um, while it was still under construction in the late 1500s, it was attacked um, by none other than Sir Francis Drake from England, who had arrived in Cartagena with more than 20 ships and about 3,000 or so men. Um, and they destroyed much of the city and did uh, a significant amount of damage to the cathedral that was under construction. Um, but the locals paid him off, and he left after only about six weeks and never came back. So they were able to finish the cathedral um, after that. Um, tucked in behind is this uh, interesting statue of um, 
Pope John Paul II, who came to visit Cartagena along with some other countries in Central and South America in 1986. Um, one of the reasons he came to Colombia in particular was because um, that that year um, there had been a horrible mudslide um, due to uh, excessive rains way up in the mountains. This was not in Cartagena, um, but about 23,000 people died um, in uh, rural mudslides, uh, which was a, a, a terrible tragedy at the time. And the Pope came um, to the city to offer his um, to offer his support and condolences. Some other buildings around this uh, central square, this this colonial one, looks out onto the plaza and is now used for the Geographic Institute of Colombia. There's also a couple of banks, very impressive buildings around the square. This is the, uh, the National Bank, the public library um, named for Bartolome Calvo. Um, he was um, one of the early presidents of the district before Colombia became an independent country. Um, Bartolome Calvo was um, a major politician back then, and this building was built in 1907 as the public library. And probably the most uh, famous museum in the whole city is called the Palace of the Inquisition, which you can see here with its monumental doorway um, looking out onto the plaza. The building was built in the 18th century and was the center of the Inquisition in the New World, uh, along with two other cities, Mexico City um, and Lima in Peru. Those three cities were really the focus of the Inquisition, which lasted um, not as long in the New World as it did in, in Europe. Um, but the building is uh, a very impressive building to visit, um, as well as having a superb museum about the history of the Inquisition and the history of the city and, and so forth. Um, hundreds of heretics were condemned and tortured or killed um, over that uh, two century period uh, right here in this building. Um, now you can just walk in as a tourist <laughs> through the massive entrance doors. Um, and if you go upstairs, you get a nice view out over the plaza and over to the cathedral off in the, in the background. This is the courtyard inside, the interior courtyard, um, where most of the museum exhibits are located. And a kind of disturbing thing um, is that outside, um, if you go around the corner on the side street, there you'll see this little window um, where citizens could anonymously accuse people to the Inquisition. So if you were having a dispute with your neighbor, or um, someone you were involved with in business or who knows what, or a family member. <laughs> um, this was a place where you could go and uh, cause them some trouble. On the opposite side of this uh, Bolivar, uh, Bolivar Square is um, a museum called the Museum of Zenu Gold, which is not very large. And I actually like smaller museums because um, you don't feel overwhelmed and you feel like you can actually give them attention without getting tired. Um, it's it, The name refers to one of the tribes that was here in the area um, in pre-European times. And it has some excellent exhibits on pre-Columbian um, art, artifacts, uh, the, the history and agriculture and lifestyle and uh, so forth of the tribes that lived in the area before the Europeans arrived. Um, there was a lot of gold, of course, in South America. So there are amazing displays of different gold artifacts, jewelry, household items, uh, funerary objects, things like that. Um, and uh, these are some examples of old clay flutes that were in the shape of fish. Um, and there's even a room I, I found just mesmerizing. There's a room where you can just sit um, and listen to recordings of uh, old uh, traditional songs played on these instruments. Right next door is another little museum, which is technically a store. Um, so it doesn't cost anything to go in, um, but it's a museum about emeralds. Um, and emeralds, um, you may not know this, but Colombia is the second largest producer in the world after Brazil. 
of emeralds. Um, and this uh, store, there's a number of places all over the city where you can shop for emeralds. Um, but this particular one actually has a pretty nice little museum um, that talks about the history of um, emerald mining in the country and has examples of different kinds of emeralds, different qualities of emeralds, so that you can see examples um, around the world, understand how they were mined, how they are processed and turned into, into jewelry. Um, there are all different uh, types and qualities. Brazil actually produces more in terms of quantity, um, but Colombia is considered to have higher quality um, emeralds. So here you can see some raw emeralds. And then, of course, at the end, you can uh, shop their extensive uh, collection of pretty much nothing but emerald jewelry, plenty to, to choose from in, in a lot of different price ranges. Um, there, a lot of it is extremely expensive, but some of it isn't, and it depends on whether you're looking for something that's, um, you know how jewelry is, it depends. Um, I tried on, I don't actually, I'm not really much into jewelry, but I tried this one on, um, and this little uh, emerald ring was only 4,000 US dollars, so I did not purchase it. Um, but I did try on another one that was only about like $300. Um, but that's still, I, I have no particular interest in emerald, so it was no big deal for me. But um, if you like, uh, uh, even if you're not into buying jewelry, it's kind of fun to just see the different uh, examples. Um, some other types of architecture that you'll see around the city from different time periods. This one's Art Deco. Uh, most of the buildings in the city are older from uh, the 17th, 18th, 19th century and, and often restored, but there's a few things later than that. Um, this is near the cathedral um, and this long, beautiful arcaded building is a center for Caribbean art. And I'm, here I'm just showing you again, some typical street scenes. The balconies, as you can imagine, are very um, sensible in, in the climate uh, because they allow you to hang laundry out on them. They allow you to go outside and um, have breezes come in through the second floor, whatever breezes there happen to be. Um, even though most places that you stay these days um, would be air conditioned. Um, another big thing to buy is jewelry, uh, different kinds of crafts and stuff on the street and hats. I'm not a hat person, um, but I kind of wish I was because I liked these hats. Um, this is a local bus. Um, it, it may remind you of the party bus that I showed you earlier, but it is not. Um, it is actually just a, a part of the local transit system, um, which is very inexpensive and a good way to get around if you want to go outside of the um, the, the, the old historic city. Um, many good restaurants, although I didn't try this one because I wasn't sure exactly what something else referred to. <laughs> uh, this is my, um, I had to go, because of the heat, I went back to my room uh, at least three or four times a day um, to rinse off in the shower. Um, and to maybe get some a cool drink and sit upstairs. And this was the view from the roof terrace of my hotel, looking back towards the cathedral out over the buildings of the old city. Uh, this building was right across the street and was in the process of being renovated, a, a beautiful uh, kind of uh, neo-colonial style. Um, one disappointment I ran into is this kind of unassuming building um, used to be open to the public for visits, and it isn't anymore because it's a private home. It's the home, or was the home, of uh, the Nobel Prize-winning Colombian novelist Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Um, and he used to live here, um, and it is now owned, uh, privately owned, so you can't visit, but you, you can walk around the outside. It's right on the ocean side of the city. Um, and interestingly, right next door, um, more recently and famous for a different reason uh, is Shakira, <laughs> uh, the singer. I don't, uh, I, my guess is that's only one of her. I'm sure she has many homes, 
um, but one of them is right right next door to Garcia Marquez. There's a nice a number of very nice neighborhoods to explore in the old city. Um, if you go up to the northeast, this one is called San Diego. Um, here you can see on the left one of the towers of the uh, University of Cartagena. And on the right is a building that um, I think it used to be a church. It is now part of the Institute of Fine Arts. Um, and there's a beautiful church there that um, wasn't open very often, but I was able to sneak in um, just by chance one day. The exterior is very unassuming. You could almost walk right by it. It's called the Church of Santo Toribio. Um, but um, even though the outside is kind of uninspiring, the inside is gorgeous. It has um, this incredible altarpiece in the Spanish style, which you could swear you were somewhere in, in Andalusia in Spain. And it has an, a, a very beautiful Moorish style uh, ceiling with the, the different kinds of inlays. Uh, just a beautiful, beautiful spot. It was one of the last churches to be built during the colonial period. So that's why it's um, it has a slightly different style from some of the other ones. And should you be in the need uh, in the market to have disco balls delivered, um, this is your guide. Um, or on the other hand, if you want to um, denounce any of your neighbors, you can follow the Calle de la Inquisición and go all the way back to the, to the museum in the center of town. Um, I ate in a couple of really nice restaurants. I, I love ceviche. Um, I don't know if you do, um, but there are there are great restaurants in all different price ranges. I ended up eating twice at this restaurant because I liked it so much. They they serve almost nothing but ceviche, um, and it was delicious. Here you can see the some fresh ceviche on the left, some of the best I've ever had, um, along with um, kind of an open face sandwich that's uh, shrimp and coconut sauce um, and a mojito. Um, one of the one of the better mojitos I've had, and actually this is probably the first of at least two or three mojitos. And for dessert, I had just um, some ice cream with some candied uh, local fruits. I don't even remember what kind they were. Um, very close to my hotel was a theater, um, a much more recent theater. This was built in 1911, so it's almost uh, an Art Nouveau style very European style uh, building. It was built as a municipal theater for the city um, and is still used um, for performances and lectures and so forth. I was able to sneak in one night because uh, it was open for a, a lecture um, that it has this sumptuous interior. Unfortunately, of course, it was all in Spanish, so I had no idea what it was about, um, but it gave me an opportunity to at least see the inside of the building. But they have music performances and uh, uh lectures and plays and things like that another one of the neighborhoods more to the west is um called santo domingo um, and it focuses on this plaza where the church of santo domingo um, presides over it um, and again more of the um, ladies with fruit on their head in this case they're standing in front of a um, very famous sculpture um, this is a, an artist known, a Colombian artist known as Fernando Botero, and he is well known for his voluptuous, big, um, oversized nudes. Um, there's a lot more of them in Bogota, from what I understand. Um, there's a whole uh, number of his uh, artworks around the city there. This is the only one I think that's in Cartagena. Um, and this plaza also is completely surrounded with cafes and restaurants. Um, but I think part of the joy that I found there was just to stroll around the city and um, stop in a shop or a museum, get a cup of coffee, get a drink, um, and admire the street life and the architecture. There's some just incredibly beautiful buildings, um, many of which are restored, many of which are in need of restoration, um, and a lot of them are somewhere in the process. Um, another way to get around downtown, uh, in addition to the horse-drawn carriages, you can take a tour of the city in these classic 50s convertibles. 
um, which I think are more associated with Cuba and Havana, um, but they've uh, adopted it here in Cartagena as well. Um, I I did not take one, but um, it is another kind of fun way to get around the city. The problem, of course, is that cars from that era are so large that many of them had trouble turning the corners on these very narrow streets, and they caused a lot of traffic jams. Um, but it was fun for the pedestrians. Um, I've been asked about uh, poverty and homelessness and things like that um, in the city as well. And certainly in the, the old historic city, um, I wouldn't say I saw too much of it. What, what looks like um, a homeless man here is more likely just a local laborer um, resting because it was hotter than hell and he's sitting in the shade and um, uh, putting his heat up for a little bit. Obviously, Colombia is uh, has severe poverty problems. It's gone down in recent years. Uh, at one point, it was as high as, I think, 35 percent, and it's gone down a little bit in the last decade or so. Um, in the old city, you don't see as much of it because it really is so focused on tourism. Um, as soon as you leave the old city and move into the more residential parts where your average Cartagena lives, um, it's a little bit different. Um, but uh, I think one of the biggest problems in Colombia today, as in many parts of the world, including to some degree our own country, is uh, is inequality. Um, there are extremely wealthy people in Colombia and extremely poor people in Colombia. Um, the, the biggest problems, I think, occur when those two populations live in close proximity to each other. Um, and in at least from what I saw in Cartagena, this is just one person's experience on a short trip, um, I found that um, there was definitely a uh, a separation between the, the wealth of the historic tourist part of the city and the rest of the city outside. Um, and we'll see a little bit of that in a minute because I did go out there as well. Um, but to be perfectly honest, my, uh, my impression of things like um, panhandling and uh, obvious homelessness has been far worse in uh, cities in the United States than it was in Cartagena um, by a long shot. This is a plaza right at the entrance to the um, the old city uh, called Plaza de, las, de los Coches. Uh, on the right is a statue of Pedro de Heredia, which is, uh, who is considered the founder of the city. Um, as, as night falls, the temperature cools off a little bit and the city develops a kind of a different personality. Um, the sun starts to set over the Caribbean and you can stroll on the ramparts. Um, there's a nice evening breeze. There's a few places on the ramparts where there are some, uh, where you can hear mute live music um, and get a drink. Um, and you can watch the lights come on um, over the walls, um, if if you look out south to, to Boca Grande, where all the, the city lights are. And within the old city itself, many of the monuments are lit up like the cathedral, uh, the art center, and just a lot of streets, uh, side streets. And there's, uh, uh, everyone comes out to go out and have drinks and take a stroll. And um, there's a very wonderful, warm colonial feel. And again, looking south, this is the uh, the Boca Grande district. Looks like a very typical modern skyline. Um, uh, you might as well be in, in Miami Beach. I treated myself one night to a fancy dinner on a uh, at a restaurant that is known for sort of Caribbean, Peruvian fusion cuisine. Um, and they had uh, a really nice roof terrace with a view of the cathedral tower. Um, you might not immediately recognize what these are. Um, they're actually crab cakes. Um, seafood, as you might guess, is extremely popular in most of the restaurants um, because there's fresh seafood uh, coming in all the time from the Caribbean. And, and yes, I had to have a mojito 
the first of several. This was my dinner, which looks like dessert, um, but it's not. These are actually fish, um, kind of caramelized fish um, with, um, uh, I think this was crispy kale. And this was, I forget exactly what kind of vegetable it was. It was a starchy, almost like a pureed yam, but it wasn't a yam uh, with spices and stuff. Really delicious. Um, back at that uh, Plaza de las Coches, um, the entrance to the city, there's a, a nice clock tower. And this is kind of considered the main entrance to the old city. Uh, it used to be a slave market uh, back in the old days and it was renamed in the 19th century when it became a very popular place for carriages to pick up and drop people off because the the old city has, has such narrow streets, it was easier to just drop people off at the entrance and then you walk from there. Um, and now it's a major focal point for uh, the historic city. Now you get dropped off in air-conditioned motor coaches <laughs> from the airport instead of horse-drawn carriages. But here you will find a museum of the city, uh, the history of the city, as well as a couple of fancy hotels and the governor's palace and things like that. Um, but as we stroll outside of the old city, you will see... Um, this this very uh, modern building and very recent is the new convention center right on the harbor front, and it was built on the site where the old um, uh, the old market was. We're going to visit the um, the replacement to that market that was built a couple of miles uh, further south. And for some reason that I was never able to figure out, they have two enormous statues of Pegasus from Greek mythology. Um, and also Miguel de Cervantes, who wrote Don Quixote, um, who at least was Spanish, but I couldn't find any particular connection to him, um, having any connection to Cartagena. And right across the street from this, this area is um, a big park called Municipal Park called Centennial Park. And it's a wonderful green oasis just outside the entrance to that clock tower. And it has fountains. You can get ice cream and drinks, and they has it has sh uh, shaded pathways and gazebos, and believe it or not, sloths. They hang out quite literally in the trees. Um, I'm not sure how they got there because sloths are not known for moving quickly, and I have no idea whether they were uh, actually brought into the city for some reason. Um, it kind of felt like they were, you know, municipal sloths for the city. Um, and they're hard to see because they're up in the trees and they don't move very quickly. Um, but the easiest way to find them was to walk through the park and you were, uh, every once in a while, you'd see a small cluster of people all looking up and then you know there's probably a sloth up above them. Um, in addition to the sloths, they also had tamarind monkeys uh, wandering through the trees as well. Those are certainly more common. And lots of tropical birds. Parrots are as common as pigeons uh, when you're wandering around the city. Uh, the The biggest sight to see outside the walls um, is the massive Castillo de San Felipe, which is the largest Spanish era fort um, in South America. Um, and it was built to defend the land side of the city. All of those walls that we were walking around on around the old city were were mainly built to defend the city from the ocean. Um, but there was a land a land access as well. And this uh, was built over an existing hill. You can see just how incredibly massive it is. Um, more of the women with the fruit on their heads. Um, it's a very short walk, maybe a 15 minute walk from the, from the entrance to the city. The construction started in the 1600s and lasted about a hundred years. And, um, you can explore the whole thing. Um, if you go with kids, it's a great uh, place to take kids because it has tunnels, hundreds of meters of tunnels that you can explore, um, which were specifically designed to allow the soldiers to move about from one part of the castle to the other without being seen from the outside and without exposing themselves to any, any danger. There's multiple different levels. Um, and in fact, one, one reason to to bother going is that you get a great view of the city from the top. Um, look, this is looking back towards the old city. You can see the convent and also the cathedral tower up in the distance. And then if you look a little bit um, 
to the left, you see Boca Grande stretching down the coast with all of its skyscrapers, as well as the bay. Um, fortunately, at the top, um, there is also a cafe, so it's really hot. Um, you can have a snack and have something to drink and sit in the shade. The building way off in the distance, we're going to visit a little bit later. This is the monastery I referred to at the very beginning that's on the highest point near the city. Um, so the view from there, the monastery is quite pretty, but um, the view is even more spectacular from up there. Um, if you read guidebooks, they will often recommend that you not walk out to the castle because um, it might be kind of a sketchy neighborhood. I didn't find that to be the case at all. It was perfectly safe to walk on the street and I had no problem, although it is hot. Um, so if you don't feel like walking, it's um, you could take a very inexpensive taxi cab um, just um, you know, a kilometer down the street to get uh, to get dropped off at the entrance. This is looking back to the castle from um, from the old city across the bay. You can see the incredible size of the castle here, um, and then off in the distance, the monastery. Another neighborhood which is right near here, um, and you have to actually cross a little uh, bridge to get to it. Um, it was originally an island, um, and it's a neighborhood called Gethsemane. Um, was fortified a little bit later in the 1630s. And it has, for a long time, it was kind of a sketchy neighborhood. Um, but in recent years, it has become a much more vibrant, uh, kind of a hipster neighborhood. Um, so it has funky guest houses and hostels and uh, great nightlife and cafes. Um, and it's, it's perfectly safe now through um, both day and night. There's all kinds of things to see. And it's very well known for its street art. Um, you could call this graffiti, but this is way more than graffiti. Um, whole streets are filled with the most incredible uh, artworks in different styles by different artists. Um, Bogota, um, which is probably next on my list if I go back to Colombia, is also known for having even more um, incredible street art like this. This is a smaller version of it, but on almost every street, um, in the Gethsemane neighborhood, you will find uh, this kind of artwork. Um, so it's become a really popular place to go and stroll. And um, and it's just, it has a different personality than the old town. It's not quite as, um, it's certainly historic in terms of the buildings, but the personality feels a bit more modern and um, and fun. Uh, lots of amazing color. And just like the old city, it also has narrow streets, uh, relatively little traffic, which is nice, mostly pedestrian traffic and uh, street vendors and so forth. Uh, this one street had all the flags of all the countries of the world. Um, and in addition to the um, street art that has been done on the buildings, you can also buy portable street art if you're interested. Um, done by similar artists that you can you can take home. Color is absolutely everywhere in the city. Um, this uh, this um, is a fairly well known cafe. Unfortunately, it was it was closed because it doesn't open till later in the afternoon when I um, than when I was there. Um, but it actually has these painted butterflies. But as, as you go up towards the roof, the butterflies actually become 3D and start to float off the building. Um, and lest you think everything is beautiful, um, there's also this kind of stuff. Although I have to confess, there are some streets here in my own town that <laughs> where we have phone calls that kind of look like this. Um, Gethsemane is known also, oh, I should guess I can point out this. Um, I took a picture of this house because I thought, oh, this, I'm sure they joke about this being the Barbie house. And then not long after I saw what was the closest thing I've seen in on vacation to actual Barbie. I don't know if she lives there or not. Um, 
I will say she was, um, this outfit was fairly unusual, even in Cartagena. Uh, but the focus of, of this particular hip neighborhood is Plaza de la Trinidad, which is the, the church here. Um, and at night, there's a lot of restaurants in the area and the whole place comes alive at night with music performances and dance and um, lots and lots of nightlife um, into the wee hours. Uh, another famous place to visit in this neighborhood is the world famous Cafe Havana, um, which was one of the first places in this neighborhood to kind of fix itself up and try to attract a different clientele from, uh, from what had been there before. Um, before, when it had been still kind of a, a gritty neighborhood. Now it's getting, to be honest, it's getting fairly gentrified. But the Havana is known um, as a really good place to listen to live music, especially salsa, which um, is very important uh, in Colombia. And you can take lessons and you can hear performances. Um, it's, it's a pretty well-known place. I also took uh, a little side trip um, just a couple miles out of the center city into the totally non-touristed part of Cartagena um, because uh, there was a famous uh, market there, the market that used to be close to the center um, and was since moved a little further away when they built the convention center. It's called Mercado de Bazurto, um, and it's maybe mile and a half, two miles. Um, it would be, it, it's walkable, but in the heat, it would be a very long walk. Um, it's also a neighborhood that um, the guidebooks will recommend that you not go um, as a tourist because it's supposedly unsafe. Um, I suppose that's wise advice. But again, like I said, I never felt the remotely unsafe in any of these neighborhoods. Um, but I did end up going with a tour guide uh, to this place just because um, uh, I found a really good uh, tour, and there were only four of us on the tour, which made it even nicer. Um, he was a young guy, maybe 20 years old, from that neighborhood. Um, and it was great because he was a fount of information about the history of the neighborhood and the history of the market and all the different kinds of fruits and vegetables. So um, as much as I would have enjoyed wandering on my own, it was actually fun and educational to have someone who really knew uh, the answers to all of your questions. Um, and it also enabled us to try out some of the food in the market that it would not have been a good idea for me to do on my own because I wouldn't have been able to judge where is a safe place uh, to get stuff um, that's clean and, and so forth. And the way that you can get there from, from the park where the sloths are, um, you can hop a bus line um, Cartagena has uh, built this nice, um, they have dedicated bus lanes. These aren't trams, they're just regular uh, city buses, but they have dedicated lanes. So they speed down the, um, the main road through all of the residential areas. And in only about 10 minutes, um, you're down by the market um, and they have a electronic card system. It's a very efficient modern system. And um, if you've traveled anywhere in the world, um, elsewhere in South America or Africa or Southeast Asia, you've probably been to markets like this that are just kind of overwhelming. Um, probably not for the faint of heart. Um, there are definitely not a lot of tourists here because this is a market that is far from the tourist um, path. And it's really where the locals go to get their food, their fruits, their vegetables, meat, fish, spices, um, and also clothes, household goods, all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's right under the monastery, which we'll visit in a little bit. Um, and fortunately, because we had this uh, great guide with us, he was able to um, pick out a whole bunch of different kinds of local fruits, um, most of which I can't remember. But um, we were able to taste them and, and try them out and see what the differences are. Um, some of these... I wish I could remember which ones were which. Maracuya, there's something called tree tomatoes, um, which I think are these things here that actually look kind of like a Roma tomato, except they're orange. Um, and they're very sweet. They have the consistency and the, the skin of a tomato, but they're um, and the pulp, but they're they're very sweet. They make delicious juice out of them. Um, they also eat guavas, uh, papayas, uh, what else? That's what comes to mind. Um, and it's just 
an endless maze, block after block after block um, of different. Uh, oh, these are those fruits. They they really look almost like Roma tomatoes, but they're not. Um, and you could easily get lost. Uh, these are passion fruits, I believe. And of course, plantains are everywhere. Plantains are uh, related to bananas, um, but they're uh, they're not quite as sweet, um, and they're often used as a starch. Uh, uh, they're not as not as uh, often eaten fresh the way you would with a banana. They're more likely cooked. They're often fried um, or mashed. Um, but they're a, a staple in the area. But you can see it's definitely, th this is not the touristy part of town. Um, but I wouldn't be afraid of it. And particularly if you can find uh, a tour guide who can um, explain things to you, I think it's a, it's a great experience if you like markets. Um, the residential neighborhood near the market is kind of nice. Here's another Barbie house. Um, and this woman who is also carrying fruit on her head, is not interested in having tourists take her picture. She is actually taking um, taking those to the market to sell. Um, and a very impressive um, bit of street art that we saw, and I would have either missed this entirely or not known the significance, uh, but our guide uh, told us the story of it. This is a mural about slavery um, showing hair maps um, and uh, if you if you Google it, you can find some interesting stuff online about uh, the history of this art form, um, which was done when Afro-Colombian slaves, and bear in mind that Colombia has a significant um, variety of different ethnic groups. There are um, descendants of African slaves, there are descendants of European uh, Spanish, there are descendants of local tribes, um, but a number of the slaves um, learned how to uh, braid their hair in such a way um, that they could, um, they essentially functioned as maps on their head, uh, indicating rivers, roads, paths, mountains, and so forth to depict escape routes so that they could help uh, each other uh, find their way out of the city um, and escape into the countryside away from slavery. Um, and this is an example here you can see. Um, but if you look up online, there's some there's um, a lot of interesting literature about it, and it's something I had never even knew existed. Uh, it was just uh, fascinating and very moving. Here's a number of the other kinds of things that you can buy: old tote bag, uh, old tires that have been turned into tote bags, more people just kind of hanging out, all kinds of different fruits and vegetables. Um, palm leaves that are used to wrap up food so that you can eat it while walking down the street. Um, peas and beans, uh, legumes are obviously very common in uh, South American and Caribbean cuisine. Uh, and we had lunch at a restaurant where we had this delicious uh, chicken and corn soup. This looks like a potato, but it's not. It's some other kind of starch that I don't really remember what it was, but it was delicious. Um, fried plantains, um, langoustines, and the uh, sort of rice, uh, fried uh, rice dish with lots of seafood in it. There's also a huge fish market, although like fish markets all over the world, you kind of need to be there early in the morning to get the best. Um, but um, it was also fun to, uh, to explore. And in addition to the humans, there are plenty of birds <laughs> like these egrets who I had never actually seen standing on um, telephone wires uh, looking for handouts. So I mentioned the monastery, which is just inland from the market on the big hill, which is about 500 feet high, and it, it looms up over the marketplace and, and that part of the city. It's called La Popa, which has nothing to do with the Pope in Italy. It's actually from the Spanish word um, that refers to the stern of a ship which it kind of resembles because it's it's up and is a big protective uh, bluff that juts out over the over the city. And the view is spectacular. Um, the, uh, the, the monastery is called the Convento Nuestra Señora de la Candelaria, and it's an Augustinian monastery. 
And there's a big festival that was occurring uh, just after uh, I left. I was there towards the end of January. And the very beginning of February is um, a major festival of uh, the Candelaria. And you can see uh, the whole uh, uh, panorama of the entire bay. But the church itself is also quite pretty. It was built in the early 17th century. For a while, it was used for military purposes because it's obviously in a very good location for that kind of thing. But the the courtyard the is very beautiful, very peaceful. There can be tourist crowds. I was there late in the afternoon, so that was kind of good. And a beautiful church this elaborate gold painted altar. And there is a museum, a very small museum, uh, but it talks about the history of the saint, um, the history of the church, the building of the monastery and so forth. But one of the main reasons people go up here um, is just simply the fantastic view in every direction of, over the city from its highest point. Um, in fact, way off, that off in the distance, that is the old part of the city where we spent most of our time earlier. Um, Cartagena doesn't have quite as many cruise ships as some other destinations, big destinations in the Caribbean, but it does have them. Um, so there's a good number of people who stop there um, on cruises around the Southern Caribbean. And here you can see the old city in the distance. Um, I'm going to take you on another um, side trip before we close. Um, this this map, I've, I've confused you because I've turned it 90 degrees. North is actually to the right. Um, but the old city is here. The market, the monastery, all of that stuff is right along here. Here you can see Boca Grande and Boca Chica, which is the other entrance to this, this huge harbor here. All, much of the city spreads south along the bay. Um, and this is where you will find uh, container ships, cruise ships, um, a lot of other uh, port activity down here. But if you go out onto this peninsula, the, um, I took a day trip. This is about an hour and a half by car, uh, give or take, um, to the National Avier, which is, uh, it's, that's about 25 miles, roughly. Um, and you could get there on public transportation, but I wouldn't advise it because it's just, it's too complicated and it would take forever. Um, it's easier to hire a taxi. Um, uh, you can go on tours, uh, which will also often take you to the aviary for part of the day and drop you at the beach for part of the day. I just took a cab to, um, to the aviary where um, it is it is one of the premier aviaries in all of South America. Um, it's on an island called Isla Baru, and it showcases primarily birds of South America, although a few others too. Colombia um, has incredibly diverse bird life. And in this park alone, there are about 150 different species. Um, peacocks obviously are wandering all over the place. Uh, but there's uh, waterfowl. The park is divided into a number of different areas like uh, jungle birds, desert birds, mountain birds, coastal birds and so forth, and you can get very um, up close to, to them. Um, you could easily, if you're into birds, uh, uh, presuming that, you could easily spend a good uh, three hours there. Um, this is a harpy eagle on the left, and some kookaburras, which are not from South America, they're actually from Australia, but it was nice to see them. And they have um, extensive um, aviaries full of lots of the little tropical birds, um, with incredible colors, lots of parrots and parakeets, which you will also see in the city. Um, it's not unusual to see parakeets flying around, um, sitting on the top of uh, telephone wires right downtown. Um, and also plenty of waterfowl, um, which live um, natively along the coast. These are spoonbills. Um, this actually is from the airport in Miami and has nothing to do with Columbia, but I really like this poster, which is a wonderful picture of a spoonbill heading right at you. Um, this prehistoric looking thing is a Jabiru stork, and that big weird neck thing is something that he can inflate if he needs to, uh, either to mate or to threaten you, I'm not sure which, maybe both. 
um, plenty of flamingos. I should point out, if you didn't already know this, that the Spanish word for flamingo is flamenco, just like the dance. Um, and I'm always a, a fan of um, humorous translations. Please do not scamper the birds. Um, they also had a number of interesting raptors. This is called a caracara, which is native to Central and South America. Um, a lot of different um, birds that are known for eating insects and fruits, forest birds, toucans, which are among my favorites. And this amazing bird um, looks kind of like a condor, and it's related to them. It's actually called a South American king vulture, um, and it does live in the Andes uh, along with the South American Andean condor, and it's... Um, it's from the same family, um, but although it's much smaller, but it was uh, pretty impressive to see close up. Some kind of tropical jay and a bird uh, woodpecker. There are plenty of lizards in the city as well as out. And this is a tiny little kestrel, barely, barely bigger than a sparrow. And I tried to remember the name of this and couldn't, but it was some sort of nasty Turkish kind of bird. Um, and an emu, uh, which is not, again, this is another bird that is not from South America, it's from Australia. And I was kind of disappointed because Australia has, I mean, I'm sorry, South America has a version of this. It's a bird called, uh, about the same size, called a rhea which is another huge ostrich emu -y kind of bird. And um, I, I don't know why they didn't have a rhea because that's from South America, but they had an emu. And then while I was waiting for my um, taxi driver to come pick me up, um, I was sitting in the parking lot and this enormous iguana, probably six feet long, went back and forth the parking lot several times like he was very busily involved in doing something important. Um, but I think he was just hanging around. Back in the city, um, you actually will see plenty of uh, bird life right in the city itself, um, as well as iguanas in the trees. Uh, these look like grackles, and they are. Um, it's a special kind of Caribbean grackle, although unlike the grackles that we have in New England, these had a beautiful voice, uh, a very lovely song that did not sound at all like it would come from, from a grackle. And there are all kinds of birds. Uh, here's a flicker and some other, um, I don't know, flycatcher kind of bird. If you're into birding, um, I would definitely make sure if you go there to, to take the side trip to go to the aviary. Um, but you'll see plenty of birds in the city, even if you don't. There are lots of buzzards hovering over the city, even buzzards sitting on top of buzzards. And last but not least, a pelican along the waterfront. So I will end there and close my presentation and take a look at the questions that we've missed. Let's see. Uh, I answered the one about the water. Um, how did I find the cheap airfare? I'm always keeping an eye out for airfares. Um, I think I was just in the mood um, to go somewhere warm in January. And I don't know if you've used um, Google Flights has a handy thing where you can um, you can put in a date range. And if uh, you don't actually have to have a particular destination, you can just say, I want to go somewhere between this date and that date and look on the map and Google will tell you what the prices are for different um destinations and i just happened to be looking in you know warm warmer parts of the world um and um i noticed the airfare and i grabbed it um and it was it was perfectly fine and i think the total flight time again it's like two and a half hours to miami two and a half hours from there to um to cartagena very easy flight um someone asked about whether romancing the stone uh, the old movie with Michael Douglas and Kathleen Turner was filmed there. Um, I believe the answer is yes. I don't know exactly which parts 
Um, but yes, um, that is true. And how is the wheelchair access? Mm, not so great. Um, wheelchair. The, the good thing about at least the old city of Cartagena is that it's pretty flat. But there are curbs and there's a lot of cobblestones. So um, compared to some other places, it might be doable, but um, I think it would be it would be hard. Um, and I think, again, the biggest thing that I, I don't know, no, know if I mentioned it enough, it was hot. We're talking 90 to 95 degrees. So for anybody, regardless of your ability or your age, um, that that kind of temperature and that humidity is very draining. So you would want to make sure that um, you're always carrying water, you have comfortable shoes, and you can get back to your hotel every now and then to just um, take a load off and uh, and uh, and rest a little bit. Um, why do all the ladies on the street in the native dress all wear the same colors? Because it's not really traditional native colors. Those are the colors of the um, of the flag of the Colombian flag. It's just a touristy thing. It's a touristic, so they I'm sure they all get their uniforms from the same place. Um, can I say something about safety? Yes. So I, I did talk a little bit about that at the beginning. Um, uh, I think the, the main issues that I would worry about nowadays in Cartagena for safety are more the standard kind of ones that you should be aware of anywhere in the world, um, including uh, here in Massachusetts or any big city in the U.S. Um, violent crime is extremely unlikely. Um, for tourists, particularly if you're just taking sensible precautions and staying in um, normal neighborhoods where where there's activity. Um, I would not walk around wearing uh, carrying unbelievably expensive cameras and flashing incredibly expensive jewelry. Um, but I felt very, very safe. I was there by myself, um, had no problems uh, at all. Um, Again, most of my time was spent in the historic area where where most of the tourism is. Um, but uh, I would exercise the same caution that you would any other major city that you travel in. Um, but I would not feel any different. I certainly didn't feel any more unsafe walking around Cartagena than I would walking around uh, South Beach in Miami. Let's put it that way. Um, uh da, 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 what else uh was romancing the stone filmed at the fort quite possibly um i should re-watch romancing the stone i remember liking that movie years ago but i don't i don't remember um any more of the details about it um i'm sure if you if you look it up on wikipedia you could probably find a list of all the uh, places that it was filmed um oh someone is also asking um on some of the maps that I have, um, which are from Google Maps. Um, she saw some words in Spanish and also words in another language. Um, and um, that is, that's just me, that's not Google. Um, the other language you're seeing is Greek, and that's because I speak Greek and I'm trying to practice my Greek. So I have my Google set to do both English and Greek. So sometimes you'll see the um, uh, place names in, in that language. It has nothing to do with Colombia. Um, let's see the zoom background. Oh, my zoom background. No, that is not a photo of my hotel room. That is, um, my house in Greece, um, where I wish I were. Unfortunately, I'm in Massachusetts right now, but, um, in three weeks, I will be in my house in Greece, um, for Greek Easter. Looking forward to that. Um, did you take all of the photos? Yes. All of these, uh, photos are mine. Um, and I do have a decent camera. Um, and I think just because I didn't want to be carrying a uh, fancy camera around um, and because it was hot and I just didn't want to deal with it. Um, all of the photos in this presentation were taken with my um, with my smartphone, which is a Galaxy, Galaxy S23. Um, which has a pretty good camera um, and you can throw it in your pocket and 
it has a good zoom. And so um, it's the difference between professional cameras and cell phone cameras has really changed over the years. So um, for a lot of travel photograph photography, I think um, you can make do with uh, with a phone unless you're doing a lot of incredible telephoto stuff and um, and playing with light and, and so forth. And, and even that, um, cell phones are getting better and better. Um, for me, uh, a lot of it was just the laziness of not wanting to carry around a bulky camera. Uh, and what else? Are there Jews living there? I don't know. I, my guess would be probably not very many. I'd have to look that up to... Um, uh to find out uh the details but um uh i don't actually know i can i can look at that up and let robert know because he will send out a uh, a follow-up email and maybe i can find out and let you know someone also i just missed it um, many of the people there have darker skin did you feel at all like you didn't fit in not at all um it's it's a touristy place um half the people on the street are tourists and that's that's what they're expecting. Um, but what you're noticing about the darker skin is what I was mentioning about different ethnic groups because the country has a quite varied history. So you'll find um, people who are descended from the European colonial um, era. You will find people who are descended from the original uh, pre-Columbian tribes that were there long before Europeans arrived. Um, and you will also find uh, people who um, are descended from the uh, African slaves who were brought there in like the 16th, 17th, 18th century. Um, so all of those people are mixed throughout the city and throughout all of Colombia. Um, I know I saw, oh yes, um, someone caught, um, yes, my hotel was Casa Bugo, B-U-G-O. Um, I don't know if the person who pointed that out stayed there and recognized it, but um, yes, that was the name, B-U-G-O. Um, and it was very nice, very comfortable, very inexpensive and perfectly located close to everything, but on a street that was nice and quiet at night. So, so I think I think that's all of them. Did I miss any? Yeah, Jeff, I think you pretty much got everything. And uh, it is 830. So this probably is a good time yep. to to start wrapping up. And I don't want to, uh, I've been lucky. We, I haven't lost power yet. Even this oh. like, these 40 <laughs> to 60 yeah. mile per hour winds. I'm, I'm uh, hearing, so uh, I don't I'm want to tempt fate. hearing more rain and sleep here. So, yeah. 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 But uh, folks, let's give Jeff a big virtual round of applause for another wonderful presentation. Uh, haven't booked it yet, but I'm sure Jeff will be back with us uh, sometime in the next couple of months. Uh, so make sure to look for that. I'll be sending a follow-up email tomorrow with a link to this recording, a link to a feedback survey, information about some other upcoming virtual programs. I'll include Jeff's email address in case you had any questions tonight that didn't get answered or you think of something later. Uh, in addition, Jeff, if you have any answers to questions you want to provide me with, yeah. uh, feel free. I'll send something uh, to you in the morning. That would be great, Jeff. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Jeff, any last words for the audience before we wrap up? No, I'm I'm glad you enjoyed it. And I hope you get a chance to go because it really is. Um, it was my first time in Colombia and I fell in love with the place and can't wait to go explore other parts of the country. And I would I would definitely encourage you to go. Yeah, great. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. I hope you have a great night. Thanks I for hope having me. Watching has a great night. Yeah, yeah. you're the best. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye.